All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the emergency managers panel. So what you're getting ready to see is uh, <clears throat> our talk with is personnel from City of Port St. Lucie, St. Lucie County, and Martin County. Over 200 years of experience uh, collectively between all of us. Uh, we're going to share knowledge, discussion on managing a storm, and provide before, during, and after tips to residents. So I want to introduce the panel to you first. Uh, Billy Weinshank, really raise your hand. Uh, Billy is the Emergency Management Division Director for the City of Port St. Lucie Office of Emergency Management. Uh, Karen Kozak, Karen, is the Emergency Management Safety Planner for the St. Lucie County Department of Public Safety Division of Emergency Management. Sally Waite. Sally is the Martin County Emergency Management Director. And Sanji Hawkins, who is Martin County Emergency Management Deputy Director followed by me, Shane Ratliff. Uh, I'm the Emergency Operations CRS Manager for the City of Port St. Lucie Office of Emergency Management. And then finally, our moderator for this panel is Mason Kozak. Mason, he is the Emergency Management Project Assistant for the City of Port St. Lucie Office of Emergency Management. And just so y'all know, he's the one that organized this entire thing. So give Mason a round of applause for that. So Mason's going to take over from here and I'm gonna sit on the panel. Go ahead, Mason. All right, so as Shane said, we have a group of emergency managers here. I'm gonna be the moderator leading the questions for this panel. Um, some of the questions for this panel will be directed to everybody. Some of them will be directed specifically to members of this panel. If you are one of the people that submitted your questions before this event via email, we've tried to incorporate it or we've answered you directly, hopefully to answer your questions about hurricane safety or emergency management. Um, if anyone in the audience does have questions at the end, we are more than happy to answer it. Or if we are not the right people to answer it, we'll direct you to the right people for this event. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So this first one is directed to everybody. It is emergency management is still a new field. What is emergency management to those that may not be aware of the profession? Who wants to go ahead and take that question? So um, what we do, I think it's easy to kind of define what we do instead of what emergency management is. What we do is we, when something big happens, it exhausts local c capabilities. So that's like law enforcement, fire rescue. Can you all hear me? Law enforcement, thank you. Law enforcement, fire rescue, emergency medical, whatever. Once all of our local resources get overwhelmed, Emergency managers get involved and we kind of step in and try and coordinate between the agencies. If the agencies don't have enough human resources or equipment, we'll ask other agencies um, to send their resources and equipment in. So we kind of like, when something really big happens, like a hurricane, like COVID, we step in and we work with other response agencies to try and get you, our residents, what they need to make it through okay. Thank you, Billy. Does anybody else want to give a try on answering that? May have a different idea. Shane, I see you going. Yeah, um, just wanted to say, contrary to popular belief, emergency management doesn't just deal with hurricanes. So uh, those of you who are not from Florida, you had emergency managers in those states too. Um, I did. I did this in Kentucky, so I never dealt with a hurricane when I was there. It was. I, we were too busy dealing with tornadoes and floods. So, um, but yes, emergency management is, is all around the country in every state, um, and it's not just focused on hurricanes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in some of the other questions towards uh, that as we go through. Mason, I would like to add, if you, know, if you remember nothing else about emergency management, what we teach is the three C's. Communication, collaboration, coordination. So you want to know what those are. Communication, that's exactly what we're doing right now. Part of that communication is education, helping you prepare for whatever the hazard may be. And it's just like Shane said, don't think always about hurricanes because there's other events that's going on. The collaboration piece there, we have to interact with our community, our private partners, our um, non-government agencies, you know, the Red Cross, Salvation Army. The private partners have to come into this whole piece. And that coordination piece, we can't make it happen unless we have the whole community involved. So remember the three C's. 
And what I'll add to that is, in particular, when you think about responding to any emergency or disaster, it starts with preparedness. So this isn't just something that occurs just during a part of the year or during hurricane season. It's a year-round effort. It takes training. It takes planning. It takes working with our partner agencies year-round. And that is the most important thing is that truly is a whole community effort, as Sanji was saying, and even as Billy had mentioned as well, is that it takes all of us working together, but it is a year-round effort. All right. So the second question, this is going to be directed to Billy, Sally, and Sanji. Uh, you three are all directors for an emergency management and agency, but Sally and Sanji, you're with a county agency, and Billy, you're with the city. What are the similar and different roles that the city and county fulfill? I know we kind of hinted on the different plays, but just wanted y'all to give an answer to that. Well, according to Florida statute, the counties have the authority to issue evacuations and provide sheltering to their residents. Um, the cities, you know, we have to have the, the city's cooperation to make sure that the city residents are, are doing what they're supposed to do as well. We have the ability to request resources from the state um, that the cities need you know, for their, their, their residents too. And do you have anything, Sanji, that you want else to add? I can, um, I can add on to that from, uh, from a city perspective. One of the uh, meteorologists, I think it was James Whelan and, and um, Mike Lyons, our first two meteorologists to speak today, they both stated that all emergencies are local, and they are, right? So locally in Port St. Lucie, we're, we're here for the citizens of Port St. Lucie for our residents and we'll do everything we can. We'll assist the county with evacuations. We'll assist with shelter operations and all the other things, clearing the roads, um, working with FEMA and the state to open up shelters. I mean, I'm sorry, to open up uh, disaster recovery centers like where, we, where you would go to get additional assistance after the disaster, food, water, et cetera. We'll work and coordinate all of that on a local level. When we get overwhelmed, we'll go to the county. When the county gets overwhelmed, it goes to the state. And God forbid the state gets overwhelmed, it's going to go up to the Fed. But either way, we have like this chain starting at the local level, at the city level, moving up to the county, onto the state, where we're all working together to try and get you, our residents, everything you need to make it through OK. And just kind of going back, what Sanji said, a lot of that starts like right now, right? educating you about what do you need what you know what can you do to prepare things like that and we all you know we all collaborate and work together you know in st lucie we have a monthly or every other month the city emergency management and county emergency management as well as city of fort pierce we all get together and talk about worst case scenario what are we going to do to help everybody so it's a team it's a team effort absolutely and just a question here, how would your agencies notify citizens of any disasters or emergencies happening in your jurisdiction? For Martin County, we use Alert Martin. We also um, use a social media platform. We have, you know, Twitter, Facebook, you know, all the, all the social media toys that are out there. But, you know, most importantly, I think we use the media to help us, you know, with all of our local media channels to get the word out. Um, but to residents in particular, we really use our Alert Martin system. You can sign up for Alert Martin. Well, we have Alert St. <laughs> Lucie. We talked about it's the same. They're all, they're all generated out of the state of Florida's Division of Emergency Management through a system called Everbridge. Too much information, but um, Alert St. Lucie, Alert Martin, Alert Palm Beach, whatever, mm -hmm. all the rolls down through the same system. So you have to subscribe to this, though. Uh, it's St. Lucie, C-O dot gov. Dot, dot gov forward slash alert. Slash alert. And then you register and you sign up for the alerts you'd like to get. And Karen, can they go out to y'all's booth in the art gallery for that information on Alert St. Lucie? Yes. Um, so you can see a stop by the St. Lucie County booth and there is that information there as well. If you go to the St. Lucie County website under search, you can put in um, alert St. Lucie there and it'll... Uh, bring you to the link to where you can click on it and go and register as well. Thank you. So aside, let me just, aside from that, we also coordinate with our communications department here in Port St. Lucie. We push all that information out through social media, 
through the through our website as well. So, and we work with local media too, like the meteorologists that were here. We're talking and working together behind the scenes to give you, to give you like a, the same picture, right? You don't want to turn on channel 12 and hear one thing and channel 10 and hear something else. So we're all working together to give you like a coordinated message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And well, this is to the... Oh. There was a question. Oh, where yes, was the question? Um, the question for those of you that could not hear that is what if when my power goes out and I don't have access to my phone, I can't get reception, how do I get that information? Um, does anybody want to take a shot at answering that? I know there's some good answers for that. Mm -hmm. Karen? Oh. Sorry, it's Sanji. No, okay. it's going to be your weather radio. So do you have a weather radio, Denoa? Yes, ma'am, Denoa. So again, part of the preparedness piece when we spoke of that earlier there is to help you prepare. So yes, you may lose electricity and stuff of that nature, but you still want to be informed. I still have a landline phone. I know people think that's right now, why do you still have one? If nothing else works, you can plug it into that wall and you will continue to get some type of information. That weather radio, that's going to be another option for you. So we can't just depend on one thing. You're going to have to have some redundancy in your preparedness as well. So again, now text messages generally will continue to come through, even on your smartphone. A text message will continue to come through. So again, think about redundancy. If you don't have a landline, make sure you get your radio. You can go to Walmart or any places like that. NOAA, N-O-A-A, weather radio, alerts continually come through that. Okay. Thank you. That was a really good question. Sorry, so yeah, satellite phones as well. I don't know about text, phone. but satellite phones are our backup. When, I mean, they're expensive. It could be about $100 a minute. But when everything fails, we have satellite phones to get in touch with state, Fed, etc. All right, we're going to jump ahead here. I'm going to move on to Shane and Karen. Uh, you are both in charge of your agency's CRS program. What are those programs for the people, the residents, because that's usually when you say CRS, nobody understands that. Can you just give a brief explanation of what it is and what you're doing? Okay, I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, CRS is the community rating system, which doesn't mean any, anything to most people, but uh, it's part of the National Flood Insurance Program. So any of you that have flood insurance policies, it was underwritten by the National Flood Insurance Program. That's the only way to get flood insurance in the United States is through the National Flood Insurance Program because private insurers will not underwrite a flood policy. Why don't they underwrite a flood policy? Because it happens too often. Um, flooding is the biggest hazard we face. It's not hurricanes, even though we're sitting in the middle of, I guess you'd call it Hurricane Alley instead of Tornado Alley, um, but uh, we're sitting around the middle of Hurricane Alley. Uh, hurricanes is not the biggest threat we face, it's floods. Um, the hurricane, our building code is so good in Florida that most likely, as long as your home was built after, I think, uh, uh, what's his name, my clients was saying this morning, 2001, the, the most current version of the Florida Building Code, um, as long as it was built after them, you're probably not going to have a wind problem, but you sure are going to have a water problem if that hurricane dumps 42 inches of water in 24 hours like one just did last year. Um, you're going to have a water problem. You're not going to have a wind problem. You're going to be, you know, up to your neck in water. So. The CRS program, um, what it is, is government participates in the program, which unlocks the ability for its residents to buy flood insurance. If we weren't part of the CRS program, you couldn't even buy it. You, you would not be able to buy flood insurance at all. So by us participating, you get the opportunity to buy flood insurance and buy the activities that we do to try to mitigate against floods. It brings us into tiers or what they call classes. Everybody starts. Everybody starts at a class 10 when they enter the program, which is the lowest, and one would be the highest. Um, as you come into the program and you do activities and they re-verify that you're doing the things you say that you're doing to mitigate flooding in your jurisdiction, then you move up the, well, down the ladder, up the ladder, however you want to look at it, because they do it backwards from 10 to 1 instead of 1 to 10. Um, 
So it's very similar to the fire insurance class rating. If you don't know how that works, it's the same company, ISO, that, that, that grades and does the scoring and decides what class you're going to be. Um, and so fire insurance has the same thing. You can be a class five ISO rating or a class one ISO rating um, uh, for your fire services. Uh, so the lower the number, the bigger the discount on your flood insurance policy. So remember, just by us participating, you can buy flood insurance. Each class that we move, if you live in the special flood hazard area, which is a flood zone, any of the flood zones, every class is 5% discount off all the policies that are purchased in that area. So we just, the city, Port St. Lucie, just re-verified in 2021 and we got our results in 2022 because it takes them a year to go over all this stuff. Um, I mean, we're talking reams and reams of paper to prove all the things that we're doing. And so we move, we're going to be as of April, because they set the date, April 1st, 2023, the city of Port St. Lucie will move from a class eight, which is what we were before, to a class five. So that's going to be an extra 15% discount on flood insurance policies above the 10% you were already getting. So 25% off a of flood insurance policy in the special flood hazard area, and then everybody else outside of that area gets 10% off. So uh, that, that's, that's what the CRS program does is, is, is it, it encourages us and encourages you to mitigate against flooding so that you get a better rate on flood insurance. Karen, would you like to add anything to that? So um, something that I would really like to highlight with what Shane is talking about is that this is a program. So with the program, he had mentioned these activities. And the more of these activities that you can say we do or we implement within our community, that is obviously what increases the insurance discount that we get. So a couple of those activities is community outreach, community education. So we're getting out into the community and we're heightening flood awareness, what can we do to help pre prevent a flood? Or if your home is damaged from a flood, what can you do? So again, educating the community, open space preservation. So if we have areas within our county or our community that floods regularly, what can we do to maybe help preserve that space? So maybe nobody can build there or you know there isn't any construction. So again, that's gonna help decrease the impact. So if someone built there, it would flood. So if we can go in and preserve that space and say, we're not gonna build there, then again, we're protecting you as a homeowner and we're protecting us as a community as well. Resources to the community. You can go on to Martin County's website, City of Port St. Lucie's website, St. Lucie County's website, flood protection information. So there's resources available for you there. So if you have particular questions about possibly how that affects you or flooding affects you or your neighborhood, that's a resource for you as well. And again, something else that Shane had mentioned is there's building codes. Are we staying up to date with the state, uh, state of Florida building codes, particularly for our area? So that's just a couple of those activities that we do participate in. Thank y'all both. Um, I know, Karen, you kind of hinted toward this, but <laughs> if somebody was interested to see if they were in a flood zone, where would they go for, on the county's website for that? Okay, so St. Lucie County, um, St. Lucie Co. gov is our website and then you can go under public safety or search flood protection information that will take you to our web page and there's a link on there that you can um, click on to find out about you know what flood zone you live in also there's a site called risk riskfactor.com it is another validated source as well um, to where if you want to put in your address it'll give you the information for your flood zone and Shane, we do have an interactive map for our flood zones. What's, how do you get to that? Um, all of our flood stuff, we put on one web, pa you know, one page, which that's one of those activities we were talking about. The, yes. it's, that, that's under activity <laughs> 352B, uh, is to have one website that, that has all the links and everything you need to know about flooding. From that one site, you can get to wherever it needs to be. So ours is www.cityofpsl.com, which is the city's page slash flood. So cityofpsl.com slash flood, you go there and you can go all the way from local all the way up to FEMA and find out anything you want to know about flooding uh, or how to mitigate against it in, in, in your area. And it, there's also, it, it says know your zone is one of the things. Know if you're in a flood zone. You click on that, put in your address, it'll show you what flood zone, if any, that you were in. Thank you all. Um, this is a question for the entire panel here. 
what kind of education training do you need to be for emergency management? I don't know who wants to take a jab at that one first. I will. <laughs> um, there, the, there's a college curriculum to take. It's um, it's it's under um, public. It's a public management degree with a special specialization in emergency management. There's some emergency management started with no college, just through years and years of experience. I mean, I think in most fields, experience is probably the best teacher. But to get in, you know, especially nowadays, you usually need some kind of college degree. So. I would say a bachelor's, public, uh, bachelor's degree in public administration with a specialization in uh, emergency management. Indian River has a great problem, program that does that. And, you know, there's so much training out there for emergency managers. Some of it's free right on the FEMA website. So if it's something that interests you or your children or your grandchildren, you know, please, you know, research it. Go to FEMA.gov look at emergency management classes and learn. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I've got just a couple more. So, some agencies, um, depending on where you are or how many people they have, a lot of it has to do with how many positions they have to fill, um, will ask for some kind of certification, uh, such as an FPEM, uh, which is a Florida Professional Emergency Manager, which is given by the Florida Emergency Prepar Preparedness Association. Uh, or a CEM, which is an internationally recognized certified emergency manager by a company uh, uh, or a nonprofit I called IEM, um, and the International Association of Emergency Managers. So some, it, depending on what position you're looking at, like if you wanted to be a director somewhere, you probably need to have something like that because that shows that you have all these years of experience. Because with having all that experience, you probably have somehow uh, lucked your way into getting one of those certifications as well. Um, but then FEMA requires that all EM staff and anybody that's, you know, working on uh, in <clears throat> disaster management, and these anybody can take if you just want to learn, um, uh, they, it's called the FEMA Independent Study Program. Um, so if you go to, like, uh, Google and Google FEMA Independent Study, um, the, the classes are 100, 200, 700, and 800. Those four classes at a minimum everybody has to have. And then depending on whether you're in leadership or you know whether you're uh, leading groups of people and stuff, you may have to take like uh, 2,200. And then there's in-person classes which you won't be able to take unless you are in emergency management. But uh, you can take, they've got like 900 classes I think now. Every I mean there's like 900 independent yeah. study classes. So if you're bored and you want to learn more about how to how emergency managers think and work go there and just knock yourself out because i know i've had people come up to me at conferences uh who weren't in emergency management that said i've done 72 uh fema classes <laughs> i'm like good for <laughs> good for you <laughs> i have not but good for you <laughs> does anybody else want to add on to that i will okay so most of y'all are probably pretty familiar with the large wildfires that happen out in Florida and on the west coast of the United States, right? So when you think about those large fires, you know that's bringing in a lot of different agencies that has to work together. Sometimes these are agencies that are maybe from within the same state, could be neighboring states, could be even from the other side of the country. The most important thing is, is that when all these different agencies that come together that maybe have never even seen each other or to practice together or train together, we're gonna to have to be able to respond together in a very organized fashion. So there's a lot of these classes that we take that is put on at a federal level um, that helps us with training, communicating, um, working with our partner organizations, and there's all these other trainings and classes that emergency managers are expected to have to be able to work together. So there's another la um, layer to that. So there are these trainings that we do take called incident command system classes. And those are these classes that we do take so all of us up here can work together to help respond to serve our community. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, another question I have for the group here is, we've talked about hurricanes, flooding. What are some other threats to this community, disaster related? that y'all would think about that kind of keeps you up at night? 
Uh, well, I would say just after, you know, just infrastructure in general, um, we've seen, you know, what happened in, in Fort Lauderdale um, with the high-rise structure failure. Uh, we actually had a structure issue with the Roosevelt Bridge. You know, those things are, those things are what we consider a hazard in our community. Um, and we talked about hurricanes, and hurricanes to me are, that, that keeps me up at night because I worry that people are complacent because we haven't really had a, a severe storm to the Treasure Coast in a very long time. But seeing all of, you, all of you out here, you know, wanting to listen and wanting to be prepared makes me feel a little bit better about that. Um, but there, you know, there's, there's, there's terrorism, there's active shooters. These are all things that can help, you know, become disasters. So I guess we all stay up a lot at night. For me, um, being from an area where hurricanes weren't prevalent, tornadoes is what keeps me up at night because in, in, in the tornado belt where I'm from, that's all they talk about. Just like all they talk about down here is hurricanes, but people don't talk about tornadoes down here. And Florida gets as many tornadoes as Kansas, but they're usually EF zeros or EF ones. They're really low grade, not very strong tornadoes. But when one of these hurricanes comes in, hurricanes usually have tornadoes wrap, they wrap, they wrap around tornadoes within them, and you could easily have an EF3 or EF4. And I lived through, you know, emergency management lived through a huge tornado outbreak where it took out entire cities. Um, and, and I mean, you get no warning. Like, we, we are so lucky in Florida that you get three, four, five, six, ten days warning that a hurricane's coming. You get 35 seconds warning that the tornado's coming. You don't get to evacuate. You don't get to run away from it. It's going to hit you. So that, that keeps me up at night is having it, the, way, the way the weather is, keeps changing. I'm afraid we're going to start seeing crazy stuff like big tornadoes in Florida. I'll add um, one thing to that. One thing that really, like, you know, aside from if I get my wife angry, that's very scary. But um, one thing that keeps me up at night is... is um, Unexpected floods, like Hurricane Harvey, is a good example. That was, you know, that was like a huge flooding that I don't think any city's infrastructure would be, or counties or whoever's infrastructure would be able to keep up with. And we have a saying as emergency managers: run from the water, but hide from the wind. The, the water is the most deadly thing, right? If you look at like the statistics of who died from hurricanes and how they died. Most of it is from flood. I'd say about 85, 90%. So if we got some kind of an event where we're getting like 20, 30 inches of water dumped on us per day, per 24 hours, it's, it's, uh, I, I, it would be very, very difficult for all of us. We would deal with it. We'd keep you safe. But it's, um, it's a scary scenario. And as Shane was saying, things are getting a little crazy in the weather world, so that kind of thing really uh, worries me. Before we open up to uh, final questions, I just do want to ask, we've already given some preparedness tips. Does anybody else want to add any preparedness tips for what people should do before the storm, before an event? Billy? I do. I, kind of in line with what Sanji's three C's, there's three, uh, three things that we encourage everybody to have. One is to make a plan. Know what you're going to do, right? Where are you going to go if you need to go? With that comes know your zone. If you leave in a, if you live in a, not leave, if you live in a flood zone, odds are when we get a storm, even a Category One, you may have to evacuate. Your first step is knowing: Do you live in a flood zone? So get a plan, know your zone, and lastly, make a kit. Have supplies in your house for seven days for each family member, right? So that's seven gallons of water. Seven, my favorite is Dinty Moore beef stew in a can. You know, seven meals, seven times three meals um, per family member, right? Non-perishable food, Dinty Moore beef stew, tuna fish, etc. things like that. You know, all, all of that are on our websites without me taking up the whole forum's time with all the details of that. It's on our website. I'm sure it's on mm -hmm. Martin and St. Lucie County's website. So please, those three things, know your zone, build a kit, have a plan. That's instrumental. 
you all want to add on to that? I see Sally. Well, I just like to say, you know, I mean, there's the stand forms. Make sure you're you're keeping up to what's happening with the storm, but also to you know volunteer your time, help your neighbors. You know, that you might have elderly neighbors that might need assistance with shutters, or just maybe having them at your house. So you might know people in manufactured homes. You know, the Treasure Coast has many manufactured homes and communities. Really, just helping each other, you know, out is is really the key to keeping the whole community strong. And Karen, I saw your got something so as we're talking about planning um, you're thinking about your entire family that does include pets do you have a plan for your pets do you have the food for your pets as well um, for st. Lucie County the uh, general population shelter that is pet friendly is Westwood High School so again that's just something to kind of keep in mind as well is your entire family and that is just something I wanted to mention and Sanji yes yeah, so on top of that with the shelters Understand where your shelters are. I don't like to say, make sure that shelter's your last resort. Part of your plan should be finding somewhere to go that's safe. Remember, if you're going to a shelter, you don't have a private room. Nine or 10 chances you are in a gymnasium with about 200 other people. You have a small space, 20 by 20. Oh, no, smaller. 20 square feet. 20 square, 20 square feet. feet. <laughs> so that's about the size of a cot. They will give you a cot. If you think about it, if anybody ever went camping, that's what you're going to be sleeping on. So right now, think about it. So if you're in a module home, and if you have um, family and friends that has a brick home, see if you can stay with them. If your pets are your concern, call the Humane Society now to see if they will board your pet. We do have service animals. Do you know what the service animals are? There's only two that we will allow in the shelter. Does anybody know what they are? Lizards. No. <laughs> Gila monsters. Small ponies. <laughs> a dog and a small pony. So when we have individuals that's coming to these shelters with boa constrictors, little dragons, iguanas, and all of those, they may be emotional support animals. Don't see how boa, boa constrictor would be. But anyway, that's just my take on that piece right there. <laughs> but yes, that you have to remember. So part of your plan is where will I go? Because I really don't want to be in a shelter. But if that's your last resort, please shelter. Anybody? My senior people, one more. Sorry. If you're <laughs> living in Florida, most of our seniors, they live in Florida. Please let your adult children know where you are. Because many times, that phone call we get is, can you tell me where my parents are? Remember to let them know if you're evacuating, where you're going. If you're going to a local shelter, share that information with them. Because they are worried about you just as much as you're worried about your neighbor. So that's my only thing with being that preparedness. My, my tip is very short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, was given to me by my great uncle, God rest his soul many, many years ago when I was probably eight or nine. And go figure, I'm the flood guy now, so this makes even more sense. Hot's on the left, cold's on the right, and water does not run uphill. So get to high ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for your time. Does anybody have any questions for this panel before we wrap it up? I know we've ran a little over time, but I think it was some good information that was given out. Going once, going twice? Yes. <laughs> Where do you get the preparedness? So like preparedness information, how to stay. Um, I would recommend, just to kind of answer this question, go to the city's website, cdpsl.com backslash hurricane. There's before the storm, there's an option to look on it. And you can, you can build a kit, have a plan. It talks about all the plans you can build. And I'm sure Martin County and St. Lucie, y'all both on your websites have information about having a plan and stuff like that. If you remember ready.gov, ready.gov, that's FEMA's website, it gives you everything, even a checklist, to help you prepare. If you can't remember any of our websites, <laughs> remember that website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Is this considered a shelter? This is not considered a shelter here at the event center, no. It's usually the shelters are through the uh, St. Lucie County Public Schools. Schools. You can go to both of our county and city's website. You can look at the shelters here in the county. 
Oh, and mentioning shelters, especially special needs. You should register in your county if you need a special needs shelter or you know someone that needs a special needs shelter. And that's also on each of our websites. Yes. So the other thing to keep in mind when we do talk about shelters, Mason mentioned it, you know, it's usually the schools. Um, when the media does start announcing that they are going to open up shelters, please listen to which shelters are, they are opening. Because just because they say we're opening shelters, it doesn't mean they're opening all of them throughout the entire county. So please just be aware of which shelters are being opened at that time. All right. Any other questions, anybody? Amazing. <laughs> thank all right. Thank you all for much. all coming out. Thank you.